They have not found me yet. I'm still in the undisclosed secret location in the middle of the forest inside this giant wooden room. They'll never find me. Yes, the echoey wooden room. It's not as echoey as uh, the concrete room that I had in Miami when I was living down there. That was like the, the most ridiculously echo, echoey room in the history of the world. And we have an interview, an interview for you guys. And um, you know, you, a lot of you are thinking, "Oh, cool, an interview. You guys must know someone." Uh, actually, Pistol does. It's her brother, so he's here. Uh, but listen, here's why you want to stay and listen, and watch the interview. He works in the industry. When I say the industry, everyone's supposed to know that's like the film industry, right? He does uh, 3D animation and a lot more stuff. But you guys should watch the interview because he's also worked in video games. And if you're someone that's interested in that field, you know, wants to know how to get into it, wants to know what to look out for, well, you definitely want to check it out. Plus, he's a gamer and he's in all, uh, you know, playing a lot of uh, the games with us. So, on some of our websites. And what's that noise in the background? I don't even know. Uh, game deals. There's a lot of cool game deals going on. So, always click on the, the, the link that says game deals, guys, because. We're here to hook you guys up since you're PC gamers now. All right, let's get down to business with what's going on in the world. Oh, by the way, Vihendra is almost finished. I did like three new songs this week. Been inspired by the trees out here. Yeah, whatever. Um, let's start off by uh, mentioning the open source laptop. Now, this a long time ago. Uh, if you guys have looked at Bunny Studios, I'm sure you've seen this. But a long time ago, they announced that they were doing an open source laptop. And then it kind of went away. And nobody was really talking about it. Well. They, they came back to life and wanted to make sure that everyone knew that they're still, they're still going on. Uh, so the main thing that they changed was the, uh, the hardware. The guy's a hardware hacker, and that's what he's sort of focusing on. So, Wendell, you want to talk about what's going on with the uh, open source laptop quickly? Yeah, okay. So the open source laptop, it's okay. He dropped a bombshell in the article, which is crazy. It, it's open source. You know, a lot of people are like, yeah, let's put a Haswell in there and, you know, a really fast NVIDIA graphics chip. No, that's not what Bunny's doing. Yeah. This is strictly for hardware hackers. Now, the bombshell that he dropped is that there's a really fast field programmable gate array. Basically, an FPGA is a chip that lets you emulate other things, and they've already figured out how to emulate NAND flash. What that means is they can desolder a NAND flash chip and solder this thing on, which can pretend to be a NAND chip, but you can see what software is doing to read and write from the RAM chip. So that means in terms of reverse engineering, like if they want to reverse engineer something, they've got an incredible tool to be able to do that. It'll also solder underneath a NAND flash chip, so you can have the NAND flash chip and the uh, debugger thing soldered in together, so the debugger thing can see exactly what's happening to the NAND flash in real time. This is this this part of the laptop is totally made for hardware hacking. So, like, think back to like the Xbox One or the Xbox 360. It's like, oh, you know, how do we figure out how to hack the Xbox 360? You know, they're soldering the BIOS chip on and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, they could literally replace the NAND flash that contains the operating system for the device with one of these things, like soldered underneath the chip, <laughs> and then learn and see exactly how the operating system works. Hold on, we've got a cat throwing up over here. <laughs> 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 Hacking up a hairball, probably. But it's like it's extremely distracting. You're really talking about hardware, and I'm just seeing this cat just, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use that as a segue. The to cat about. needs some NAND flash <laughs> debugging. Yeah. Needs some debugging for sure. And it just laid down. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm finished throwing up. Let's just lay down. All right, anyway, ultra fast internet. It's expanding everywhere and it's going to be coming to Vancouver soon. So, Linus, maybe you're going to be on the list. Does he live out in the woods? I don't know. I'll find out soon. But um, yeah, ultra fast internet is coming to uh, Vancouver. $45 to $65 a month to get Goober, Google, Goober? I almost said Goober Fiber. Goober Fiber, Google Fiber-like speeds. Um, that's pretty cool. And of course, we've talked about all this going on in Vermont as well because Vtel has a service and they're offering uh, Google Fiber-like speeds for 45 bucks a month. And let me just show you what they're doing in Vermont right now because it, it, the place is crazy. They, the, the, all these guys out there running around with horses. Uh, they've got a draft horse and um, his name's Fred and he's just out there and his owner, Claude, is just walking him through the woods and they are laying fiber through the middle of rural Vermont. That's pretty ridiculous. Well, so, not um, only that, I, yeah, I mean, in this article, this article talks about micro-trenching mm -hmm. is what it calls it. 
And it's like, you know, normally when they bury cable and, you know, they have to dig up a street, you know, a lot of cities have underground cable, even small towns anymore have a, a lot of underground cable. And it's a pain to pull cable through that. You know, you have to dig up the street, you might have to lay a new conduit, blah, blah, blah. But with fiber optic cable, advances in engineering techniques mean that the cable can be laid. And so what they did in Vancouver is actually just did a micro trench, which they were able to dig a trench in between the grout of the brickwork in the street and bury the cable 20 centimeters below the surface of the street and then just regrout it and so they were done. And just right it. there on the surface virtually, I mean, I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And also it, yeah, takes, you don't, you, it takes fewer people to do the work. Like they were saying with the guy in Vermont, he's doing, with his horse, he's doing the a job that normally it would be like 15 people working on it. So this is yeah, yeah. extremely in, practical in, to get internet access or, or even you know really high speed internet access to remote regions. Yeah, in Vermont, um, you know, using horses to pull fiber optic cable is crazy, but horses can go where trucks can't, or at least where, you know, it's like, well, we got to be out in the middle of the forest here. What are we going to have to do? It's like, well, we're going to need some bulldozers. We're going to need to make a road. And we're yeah. going to need to get some trucks up there. And the trucks got to have off-road tires. And then somebody was like, well, why don't why yeah, don't we yeah. just send Merle <laughs> yeah, Cla- up there? Merle yeah, Cla- can pull the cable. Yeah, Claude was like, you know, I've got Fred, the the Belgian draft horse, and he could do a hell of a lot <laughs> better of a job than your bulldozer could. So yeah, that'll work just fine. Yeah. Let's do it. Put on my yeah, overalls. I keep thinking of the, the the Time Warner guy who's like, man, it's going to cost a billion dollars. And it's like, yeah, if you're digging up the street for and closing the street for two weeks or, you know, bulldozing half the forest, yeah, yeah time, it'll cost a billion time Warner, dollars. Time Warner Cable and Comcast and companies like that, they are thinking in terms of, like, exactly what you just said. They're thinking, thinking bulldozers. They're thinking making new roads. And they're also thinking about uh, infrastructure as far as uh, Cisco, like gigantic routers. They're not thinking about, like, uh, you know, 10 gigabit routers from, from Google with multiple 10 gigabit connections, like, and just made out of hacked hardware like Google's doing. So things can happen. If people want it, they'll find a way. And people out there, they want that fast internet so they can sell their milk. Well, <laughs> not just not just fast internet for selling milk. I mean, fast internet means that their children and the communities have economic opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have for remote working and entrepreneurship. You know, there's talk about um, this mass uh, influx of startup companies in places that are serviced by Google Fiber because they can get cheap internet. There's a guy that bought a house somewhere that uh, uh, Kansas City, I, th- I think it was in Kansas City, that Google Fiber services, and he divided the house into like four apartments, and it's like startup city. So these people are basically living and working in the house on their startup company, and he's having no problem renting that out. The world needs fast internet. We need it faster. We need it as fast as possible, as quickly as possible. All right, um, so a death this week, Douglas C. Uh, Engelbart. He's the inventor of the mouse, and he died this week. If you guys want to check out um, some old videos that he was in where he showcases the mouse and some of the, uh, some of the oldest computers out there back in uh, circa 1968, I believe it was. Yeah, there it is. You guys can check this out. It's pretty interesting, but, um, I mean, think about what we would have without him. I mean, I don't know. Is touchscreen going to take over the mouse? I don't think so. No. Someone, you still got to play your FPS games, and flailing in front of a screen just is not cutting it, guys. I'm sorry with, with your connect and all that. This is not not going to replace my mouse. All right, you have anything to say about this before we move on? Well, it's you know it really puts the the computer revolution in perspective because you know a lot of other um, inventions, like everyday inventions in humanity are hundreds or thousands of years old a lot of a lot of the underpinnings of modern things but you know here we have the mouse the very earliest version of a mouse and that guy was alive in our lifetime so that just shows you how far and how fast technology moves we are greatly accelerating and i can't believe we're not on the you know we don't have colonies on mars yet hmm library of alexandria too busy busy (laughs) fighting over oil here yeah fighting over oil and then before that the library of alexandria anybody Oh yeah, it's like oh, all, you know, here's a here's a, you know the sum of all human knowledge. Burn it down, <laughs> burn it down. God hates these books. Uh, we're <laughs> moving right along here. So, I've been screaming and yelling that Best Buy was going to go under for years, and a lot of people keep telling me the Best Buy is too big to go under, and I'm like, yeah, they're too big, but they're extremely stupid. So uh, this article <laughs> here on uh, on I Cringely is uh, very interesting. Now, uh, the gentleman here who writes for iCringely, you know, a lot of times Best Buy, they blame Amazon. Uh, and, and they've brought in some new guys, and, and, and they're trying to do price matching. That's the solution, price matching. That's, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can match Amazon.com. 
Uh, and that way people don't, don't come to our website or come to our stores and, and touch things and then go to Amazon and buy them. We'll, we'll price match Amazon. And, but they're still, they're still, they're closing. They're pulling out of Europe. Their stores are closing everywhere. What's the real problem? What's making Best Buy go out of business? Well, this gentleman here, he had uh, the opportunity to visit and he says it's because of their compartmentalized IT department and the fact that their IT doesn't seem to really care about their website. So that's what's killing Best Buy. And there's a quote in here. I'll scroll down just a little bit. Very interesting. One of the IT guys says that they know that the website sucks, but they don't want to improve the website because if they improve the website, people are not going to want to go to the stores. So by keeping the website sucky, it's kind of forcing people to go to the stores. And then he, he, then he puts here, this is actually what they think. They actually think this. It's, it's, I'm not making this up. There, there, that's what he said. Um, so, yeah, obviously, when you have that old school mentality where you need to go to a brick and mortar store in order to, to do something, of course you're going to go out of business. It, it's all got to be uh, web and the store should be just like the Apple stores. You know, Kane sent me uh, something about two or three days ago, and I f forgot to bring up the article, but I'll, I'll insert it right here about the Apple stores. The Apple stores are not about sales. The Apple stores are about the uh, touching the products, making people feel like owners before they have the products and building loyalty. Uh, no, no. Well, there was uh, something you should mention on the Best Buy thing. It's like Apple is the Apple store is about the experience, but mm -hmm. Best Buy can't really figure out because they've got competing brands and all this other kind of stuff. But the other really crazy thing is that, uh, you know, it's like Apple's about the experience, but in fairness, Apple's web store sucks. You know, you're right. So uh, I mean, people, are, <laughs> people, you know, a lot of times, even if they don't buy it at the Apple store, they'll buy it at a different website or they'll buy it at uh, you know, even at Best Buy. Best Buy has like a little Apple store as well, but yeah, their website sites kind of sucks. It's there's only a few products on there, so I mean, people still use it. But yeah, I think Apple had the right idea with making it more about um, it's 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 about indoctrination. So yeah, Best Buy just needs to be driving people to their to their uh, website to, to buy things. I mean, wherever people spend money, that's where you guys should send them Best Buy. So yeah, moving right along here, smartwatches are uh, showing up in Best Buy. What were you gonna say? Oh, uh, if Best Buy had reasonable prices on technology, I don't think they would have any trouble selling it. <laughs> yeah. And if they even had technology in the first place, they're kind of like, I don't it's know. Like, oh, we've got an Intel 80 gigabyte SSD. It's only $300. Mm, yes. Um, speaking of portable devices, Nokia has uh, confirmed that the 41 megapixel pure view phone is uh, confirmed for UK sales. A 41 megapixel camera on a phone. Uh, I'm curious to see how that's going to look because, I mean, when, when I think 41 megapixels in that size, I'm thinking it's going to be grainy and I'm thinking that, you know, of course it's going to be a crap lens. So I never really cared about the megapixels as much as I cared about the quality of the lens in front of it. And with a small device, it's always going to be a crappy lens. I've never owned a compact digital camera. I've never owned a tiny camera. All my stuff has been big because I want large professional lenses because I'm crazy like that. But well, it it turns out with CMOS sensors that having a large sensor generally means less noise as well. Yeah, so with I a mean, tiny tiny you, sensor you, like this, yeah, I mean the entropy catches up with you at that scale, so that's sort of a problem. Um, gorilla, those guys are Gorilla. They're always working on new things. They've got a new uh, glass coming out that's supposed to be anti glare, which means that you'll be able to go outside with your cell phone and not have to squint or not have to you know, worry about your cell phone being completely almost invisible as far as the screen goes. And it's also, also going to be antimicrobial. It's going to kill germs and viruses. Wipe your butt with this. Yeah. Can I make waffles with it? Can I set it to like waffle mode and then pour waffle batter on my phone and have a waffle? It does That'd have a awesome. waffle mode and it will remove the germs from the batter. <laughs> <laughs> it All sterilizes right. and... <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right, so this, this teenager that was arrested for... Um, uh, the uh, League of Legends post where he was threatened, you know, he said he said he was going to kill someone's family, and then he said LOL, JK, uh, whatever. That, that everyone's saying it's a Facebook post, but I'm not 98% sure that it's this was a League of Legends thing that happened. It started as a League of Legends thing, yeah. and then the media just simplified it to Facebook. But that's not exactly what it was. It was League of Legends. Anyway, he's getting beat up in prison right now. So I'm not even going to comment on, on how ridiculous it is that he's being held for saying something that's pretty offensive and asinine but nevertheless that's just i mean that's, if you've ever been on xbox live someone has threatened your family has there has anybody ever threatened your family wendell on xbox oh, live i'm sure i mean 
Yeah, well, I, well yeah, Xbox Live. I don't even just. You know, I think yeah. I tried that once okay, like okay, 10 years ago, and it was like. Ugh. Are you playing Quake Live, and you've just killed some guy like nine times in a row, or even Unreal Tournament back in the day? Did I mean? Did you remember someone like you killed him like fifteen times, and they're like, "Wow!" And they they throw like sixteen ethnic slurs just to make sure that they get exactly whatever you are, uh, which in our case is yeah. like you know Sasquatch. But um. League of Legends is like the Xbox Live of PC. <laughs> <laughs> Pistol said League of Legends <laughs> is the Xbox Live of PC. <laughs> so yeah, that makes total sense. But death threats are out there. But anyway, this kid is getting beat up in prison. Uh, you know what I'm going to say? Well, Society probably needed to beat this kid up, but he probably didn't need the prison. It, he probably yeah. I mean, it, it it doesn't make sense because it's like you know this this zero tolerance. This isn't really a zero tolerance thing, but there's no excuse for people along the way not exercising common sense. No, everyone refuses to think for themselves anymore. And it's like, oh, let's follow the rules. And it's like, well, the rules are, are guideposts. You know, they're not they're not necessarily hard and fast. And as soon as you have hard and fast rules, there's going to be an exception. And it, it is a real tragedy that this kid's been in prison for months now. Yeah, and they've got him on suicide watch. Um, I mean, I really think society is going in the wrong direction when we have junk like this happening. And it happens on a regular basis, not to mention the harassment from both women and men let me just go ahead and say that right now because both are harassed but you know we need to correct those things but this whole like policing what people say and throwing them in prison for for jokes that they say online even if they're you know off color and in bad taste i I don't know what to do with it but you can't be this punished for immaturity while other kinds of immaturity are not as severely punished like you know I, it's just it's insane well, you know what we need we need we need a return of the old fashioned ass whooping like people need to start knocking people out for saying things that they don't that are off color like if you walk into a room and start insulting people knock them out but it, now it's like oh you shouldn't you should let them speak let them speak knock them out and that, well, that won't happen anymore that's what they do in Boston well, you can't walk around like, I don't, say it run in your mouth I mean, <laughs> knock people out I don't even out. know that I would think about it I don't even know what I think about it in those terms it's like this guy posted this and was like, okay, somebody called the police and then the police could call the family and talk to like the doctor or whoever. Yeah. And if there were, if there were, if there was a good healthcare system in America, then mental health care would be a part of that. And chances are by the time you, you know, you're 19 school counselor or, you know, a psychologist or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, talk to the school counselor and see if they think this is a thing. Talk to, you know, somebody and see if they think this is legit because, Surely to God, somebody knows the kid and knows, you know, but that would require effort. And this is like, oh, let's yeah. put him in jail. Don't even think about it. Let's put him in jail. That's easy. It doesn't require thought or work. I mean, that that would work. I mean, that that, that does require a lot of effort. I mean, I still think a good beating would, would handle, I mean, would handle a lot of this. It's quality control. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a new way to share <laughs> yeah, files. It's like, <laughs> it's like, don't worry about it, officer. We took care of it. We've beaten him within an inch of his life. He is now chained up in the basement. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, like, I guess he, fair enough. He, he learned his lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Left hook taught yeah. him everything he needs to know. Everything's good. He'll, he'll grow up and he won't be an <laughs> asshole. All right. That so. probably would work, too. It would, it would work better than this. This guy's going to get out and he's scarred for life. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now it's time to talk to Mike. You guys need to watch this. Now, this is not going to be an interview. We're just going to stand here and drink beer. And we're sitting. How do we do this? Now, I know there's a lot of animators on the website. There's a lot of budding people who want to get into the industry out there. A lot of young guys who want to do a lot of things. So we had the decency to bring somebody here from California. This is Mike. What's up, man? Hey. So uh, what do you do? Um, I'm a visual effects artist. And uh, I do pretty much anything under the sun within that realm. But uh, that's it. I've never heard of you. What have you worked on? (laughs) I've worked on more things than you could imagine. All right, we'll start off with uh, video games because we have a lot of games yeah, on the website. So, what video games have you worked on? What have you done? I've done. I've worked on uh, Dead Space Two, I think it was. Um, Call of Duty, Black Ops. Um, what do you do for this? Like, uh, for video games, I did. A, I did a, mostly mocap. I did that for about a year and a half, two years. So they send you like the video footage of the actors with all the little balls on them moving around. Uh, we just get like we just get nasty data. Oh, so you like, don't get to see the people with the that look like Christmas trees. Well, I worked at this. I worked at a studio that had that. Like we yeah. could look out the window and see, you know, all and the they action going on. Give you the raw data from that. Yeah, we get all the nasty data, so you get like this face that kind of looks like a face, but there's like balls flying around. Is that like, like an industry term, like the nasty data? 
Yeah, it's just bad. It's just like, <laughs> like, hey, give us the nasty. You guys say, like, give us the nasty? Because I worked on a few <laughs> films, and they call they have a foreign name for everything. Like, a, a extension cord's a stinger, and, like, every, everything's something weird, you know? Like, you can't just, um, like, give me two moo cakes, a stinger, and a bag of ha. Well, like, what the fuck is... I don't, I don't know. I mean, the place I worked, actually, the be- the data would, you know, to most people would look pretty bad. Yeah. But for what I was working on, it was really nice. Like, it looks like crap, but, but I mean, comparatively... In, in the industry, is that what you guys... Is that your buzzword for it? Like, nasty? nasty? Yeah. I guess that's really just my... I don't know. I just, I, I I'm like, just oh, using nasty because it I works. I thought you were, like, getting into the lingo here. I was all excited. <laughs> like, hey, you were dropping lingo. No, I think that's more for like producers. Uh, we're just we're just nerds. Oh, uh, okay. So you guys don't have all you guys are not pretentious is what you're saying. You guys are just cool. You can find back. the same lingo on the internet probably. Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right, so anyway, back to the, you get the nasties, then what do you do with them? Then we just clean them up and then they they uh they target them, they call it, whereas they you set it up in a rig so that yeah. it actually like deforms characters properly and stuff like that. So All right, well, what uh, TV shows, movies? You work on what are some big ones? Just that people would people would know out there. Um, uh, Falling Skies, Once Upon a Time for TV. I've never uh, heard of True Blood, <laughs> True Blood. <laughs> um, what else? Magic City. That's a new one coming out soon on Showtime, I think. Um, it, you know, just randomness. Yeah. What do you usually do for those? It's like similar type stuff, or um, mostly integration. I do mostly integration for stuff like that, which is an industry term for like recreating what happens behind the camera, but in 3D, so that um, when it goes down the pipeline, um, the rest of the artists have like everything set up for them. They can right. just be like, "Oh, we're putting, you know, for example, a bone sticking out of an arm. Right. We have we have the camera moving around properly. We have the woman's arm, and we've got we've got even some placeholder geometry. So you're almost like keyframing it. Yeah, it's, what, yeah, what it's, it, it's animation. It's called it's called integration. Yeah. It's it's called it's it's mostly camera tracking and match moving. Now, how did you get into this? Did you go to school or? Yeah, I went to school. I went to school for two years. And uh, after that, kind of didn't really find anything on the East Coast. And then had an opportunity to go to um, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was after uh, the stock market crashed. I actually had an animation job um, before that in the Midwest. But the, the, the stock market crashed and we basically didn't have work for like, I don't know, we, were, we were nonstop work for like, a year and a half and then six months of just nothing and then there was there was no job I was basically laid off I didn't even like I remember when the stock market I think it was hitchhiking around the country I didn't even realize it that every yeah. morning until I got back home and I was like where's all the jobs yeah it was pretty bad yeah I, I, I couldn't even believe like it hit me like yeah it was just it didn't even really seem related at all yeah but like everyone was like we're not spending money so so how did you get like was there like a door that opened for you in Los Angeles or how, how did how did you find uh, my you brother like... lives in San Diego yeah. so I stayed with him and then um, I got an internship in Los Angeles which I took over a, a Microsoft job and because uh, you know I wanted to do art over anything yeah. I had the opportunity even if it was unpaid now there's a lot of kids out there uh, a lot of kids on our website as well a lot of, a lot of non kids on our website there's a lot of adults on our website that don't exactly know how to get started, where to go. Um, they're basically clueless, but they want to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going, should they go to school? Is that still relevant? Or can you learn things on your own? And, and where do you go from there? How do you find a job? You can go to school, but it's like one of those things where most people now is, are saying, do not do it. Especially do you for need a school. diploma? I mean, like if, you, no. if Universal Pictures called and they say, absolutely hey, not. we need someone's head to fall off. Let me see your diploma. Yeah. Is that, does that happen? No, absolutely not. Um, I rarely get asked for even a resume. It's mostly just, you know, what have you worked on, your credits, your let me see your shots. Yeah, the real. Um, I have been asked for a resume, but it's usually just a credits list. Now, I know a lot of people hit this brick wall where they say, like, hey, we need someone with experience. So how do they get experience in the first place? Because it seems like everybody wants experience. Do they, right. Should they just go out and do a bunch of stuff on their own? Should they make their own demo reel with their friends? Yeah, totally. Is that what they should do? Or yeah, I have no idea. You can do your own work or you can get an internship. You look around for internships, but, I mean, that's a whole nother... Right now, like, there's a lot of lawsuits going on with internships and how they're not, like, like paying interns and stuff like that. But it's, like, yeah. And I've seen a lot of interns, like, kind of thinking that they don't really have... They, they think it's just, you know, like, cleaning toilets or whatever, even when they're there. But they're not really taking the responsibility to, like, take it to the next level. Right. So sometimes it's on them, too? Exactly, yeah. It's, it's more on them than the, the person or this place supplying the internship. 
So hope you learned something. If you guys want, you can click on the link on the bottom of the screen and go watch the rest of the interview. We joke around, have a beer, and uh, you know, just talk about life in the industry. Maybe you'll pick up a few tips. Maybe you'll become a better person. So freaking watch it. All right. <laughs> There's a new way to share files. Um, if you're interested, ShareFest. The article is linked. We're not going to get into it unless you have anything to add to it. But it's, it's totally different. No, we can make a special on this because it's a, it's a new way. It seems simple, but there's a lot going on under, uh, I guess, or behind the scenes. But I want to start talking about Google Glass right now. I have a few things to talk about as far as Google Glass goes. Uh, there's now an app for Tesla. If you have a Tesla car, you can check on your car while you're out shopping or doing whatever. If you're hanging out with your friends, you can use the Google Glass app to check to see if your car is charged up enough to get the hell out of there. So, you know, that, that'd be great if you can be like, well, you know what? I'm waiting on my car. Let me see if I should get three more beers or not. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> well, well, I'm, I'm still blown away by the robotic battery change thing. Like you, It's like the Texaco thing from Back to the Future. And so it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you can charge your car or you can drive it into our advanced robotic thing where it pops the batteries out, pops new batteries in, and you're good to go. I want a Tesla, but I need an all-wheel drive so I can handle the snow because I need snow in my life. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Oh, what's this train? Oh, yeah, the train window ads. Uh, this is kind of about Google Glass, but I thought I had a new, another Google Glass article. I don't know where it is about the Google Glass uh, competitor. I, I think I've ac accidentally closed it, but yeah, there's that uh, new competitor coming out. Do you have that article open? Because I've, I've lost it. Yes, I do. It's, it's the Recon Jet. Buy the Recon Jet heads-up display. Limited time, limited quantity, preferred price. Orders come first serve, first serve. That sounds oh, no, so sorry, old school, I'm going to completely ignore it. Everything you just said, like the first come, first serve, limited quantities, that sounds like old school marketing. And even the name is just not catchy. I, I, I know this is such a base way to judge a product, but you have Well, they to, did use pretty much the same stuff. font as Google. So, yeah. yeah. Rip off product, I don't know. Maybe there'll be a, a viable competitor. At this time, I don't think there it, is. Um, let's talk it's about $500. Aber yeah. Unless you don't pre order and then it's $600. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, ads for a minute because the ad world is going crazy. Um, soon you're going to see ads everywhere thanks to the Connect. Uh, the ads are going to change. And we're going to see ads being integrated into strange places like train windows. Uh, if you ever like wanted to take a nap in a train, you lean your head on the window and, and then you know, just, just fall, fall asleep, it, you're, you're going to wake up and your neck's going to hurt. But now while you're trying to sleep, your head's going to hurt because they're going to beam advertisements directly into your bones. They're actually going <laughs> to use vibrations to translate ads into your head. You know, I saw this on Futurama. I think it was like the first or second episode and like Fry comes in and he's like mm -hmm. all terrified and he doesn't, you know, he has no idea what's going on. And he's like, that was the strangest thing. I had a dream about, you know, underwear or something. And, and uh, <laughs> everybody's like, oh, you know, didn't, you know, that's just an advertisement. Just ignore it. It's fine. And he's like, we, we, we didn't have advertisements and dreams back in my time. And, and he's like, we just had them on billboards and in movies and, you know, blah, blah. And he goes on a list of like 20 things that have advertisements and then... I was like, yeah. oh, Fry. You, you. <laughs> See, it's kind of creepy that they can just uh, talk to you by vibrating your bones. The next article that we thought was interesting for you guys was that uh, Google and others reportedly pay Adblock Plus to show you ads anyway. Um, and so this is kind of interesting in that Google looked at Adblock Plus and was like, well, you know, we, we really want to get our ads whitelisted. Yeah, and what, and, what the guys at know, Adblock are saying is it's money. essentially a way... Uh, it's, it's like a fee that helps them maintain their whitelist, which is kind of fishy. But, I mean, they do have a whitelist, and they do have, you know, people. You can submit sites. You can, like, download different um, people's, I guess, people's safe lists, lists and then import them into your own uh, browser. But, yeah, this is payment so they can maintain their whitelist. It sounds all sorts of fishy. If we can trust Adblock Plus, that's big if, I don't see a problem with this. And the reason that I don't see a problem with this is because for a lot of sites, ads do make the site work. And it's possible to have ads that are relevant and something that you may be interested in, especially if you're interested in buying something. Like I wouldn't mind looking at paid ads when I'm looking to buy something or I'm remotely interested in maybe buying something later. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm but, obviously not anti-ads either. We have ads on our website, and the ads help us to eat Um but we make sure that they're not obtrusive. And we do use Google Ads, and I haven't seen one Google Ad, uh, ad yet that's, good, that's installed anything malicious. or um, They're pretty good at filtering everything, so, and, and they don't take ads over the full screen. Ads that make noise. 
Well, it's it, the the kind of bad ads are ads that make noise. Yeah. Ads that are like a fake download button. Ads that have viruses <laughs> embedded in them. Download and, download roulette. Uh, those are the worst. <laughs> it's like ninety download buttons. Which one do you click? But you really need this software. <laughs> and so, you know, and at, on, at the same time, we have other companies that are looking to make more money from advertising as well. And so, AT and T has flat out said, "Well, you know." We're considering selling your browser history, location, you know, you versus usage, uh, you know, your mobile usage, uh, your location data, and more of that information to advertisers. And it's like, holy crap. That's, yeah, you know, this, you're, this you're, breaks into some privacy concerns uh, because they'll know where you are. I mean, they say it's going to be anonymous data, but they can really tie it to your phone if, if you know, like the FBI comes knocking and says, hey, do you have data on this guy? You know, and sends them a subpoena. They can be like, well, yes, we do. We don't like what he yeah, said well, on epi episode even, 65 of the tech. It's not even that. I mean, there's the, the researchers have shown that, that large enough data sets of quote-unquote anonymized data, it really isn't all that anonymous. Because if you have a couple of things in that data set, you know, a huge data set with millions of data points, yeah. chances are a few of those data sets or just the pattern in that data set can still tie you back to an individual. So even though it doesn't have the individual's name on it, it would be trivial to link those together. And advertisers have been doing that for years, and they're really good at it. And didn't Joe Biden have something to say with this uh, several years ago, like back in 2006? Uh, about This is about phone metadata, right? Is this a good segue into that? Yeah, yeah. So with, uh, with this AT&T, this, this type of data is really your metadata, like the metadata we've been, been hearing about in the news in the context of the NSA. Well, we were collecting it for the NSA. Let's figure out how to monetize it. Exactly. And so, you know, we found this really we found this really awesome article from Joe Biden in 2006 that says phone metadata collection is very intrusive. We don't know what the NSA is doing with their data. And this is from 2006. I don't have to listen to your phone calls to know what you're doing. If I know every single phone call you made, I'm able to determine every single person you talk to. I can get a pattern about your life that is very, very intrusive. And the real question here is, what do they do with this information that they collect that does not have anything to do with Al-Qaeda? And we're going to trust the president and the vice president of the United States that they're doing the right thing. Don't count me in on that. I thought that was really interesting because this is from 2006. Not a lot has changed. If anything, it's gotten worse. And we have the media and a lot of officials that are downplaying the metadata collection. And here at and is wanting to sell your metadata. And here we have Joe Biden in 2006 rightly saying, well, no, this metadata thing is, is huge. This is a huge invasion of privacy because it's not just one or two points. It's all points of data over a very long period of time. And even if you remove the person's name from it, it is trivial to tie that back to an individual. Now, if, you, if you're really confused about metadata, we do have another uh, website, zeit.de, and you can go on here. And um... You know, it is confusing, and the media, I think, is deliberately, either, either the people that are reporting on these stories really did not make it through fifth grade grammar class, <laughs> or yeah, there's bad. some deliberate distortion going on here. And so... Let's just show you what is metadata. There's a German Green Party politician, and he got six months of his metadata. And you can go to the website, go to the link, and you can hit play on that, and you can play his life, like what's going on in his life for six months, just using the location data. Now, there's other pieces of information in the metadata, uh, but this is just about his location and what he's doing. And so... And when you hit play, you'll see him bouncing all around the map of Europe, and you'll see stats about the calls that he made and the text messages that he made on the right-hand side. And this type of data is exactly the type of data that the NSA was collecting on, on you know, all mobile phone sub subscribers, Verizon subscribers, and things like that. Yeah, so they and could so essentially the do this with any, any of us. Yes, any, any individual, any name, any number, they could put in the number in the database and produce a report like this very easily very trivial to do this well you know a lot of this is not sitting well with people all over the world and this prism fallout is going to cost us billions and this is what the uh, eu has been saying uh, billions for our cloud uh, data companies in the united states a lot of people in the, in the eu do not want to deal with the cloud companies in the united states they want to sign up now with local companies instead so that's going to remove a lot of business and, um, Not only that, yeah, go ahead. but the EU voted to suspend data sharing, and that includes yep. flight, like passenger flight data. So people that are flying to the United States, the U.S. used to have their credit card numbers 
and the, the credit card number they used to pay and other data like that in this vast database, none of that is being is, is going to be shared anymore. The, e, the EU voted by a significant margin not to share that kind of data anymore. 483 voted for, 98 against, and 65 abstained. So a huge um, victory. So they really don't trust the United States anymore. And that's that's got me worried as a, as, a, as a citizen of the United States. I'm pretty worried about that. I also want to bring this up. France, um, it also came out that France is also keeping internet and metadata on its citizen, citizens or scooping it up. So it's like they've got their own sort of prism thing going on, uh, their own NSA style thing going on over there in France. So as more develops with that, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it because we're not just about the United States, of course. We're, we're people of the world around here. I said that with a southern accent. Around here, we're people of the world. So keep an eye on that as well. And like I said, as it develops, we'll talk about it more. Let's talk about Snowden for a minute. He's still looking for asylum, of course. And uh, if you guys don't know who Snowden is, you know who Snowden is. Never mind. So it looks like he's not going to be going to Iceland, uh, Iceland, despite the fact that there are several parliament members that really want to grant him uh, citizenship. They feel like it is their duty because uh, the United States of America has removed all of his rights as a citizen. He now is a stateless individual. And they feel that, uh, you know, nobody should be stateless especially and, and no one should and then they're also afraid like they, they said here like they're afraid to allow him to go back to the united states of america but because the, they're afraid that he will not be treated as, as a human being that he's going to be tortured and you know i think that's kind of interesting but um they they just said that you know what they're not going to be hearing this uh, until after the summer recess is over so it looks like nothing's going to be talked about until after summer in iceland and a lot of the uh a lot of the members of the government there are kind of upset about this, but, you know, that's just the way it goes. And there's the uh, uh, well, Bridget. I can't even say her last uh, name. Go ahead. Well, fortunately, Venezuela has offered Snowden asylum, so... Yeah, he does have... Um, he has somewhere to go now. Yeah. Assuming he can get there. Yep. It's going to be hell for him to get out of the, uh, the airport in Russia because every plane that leaves that might have Snowden on it is going to get grounded. Uh, they, they already grounded one plane. Where was it? Uh, like a Bulgarian president? Or who was it? I forgot. Um, they grounded one it plane. Was, it, yeah, it, it, it was a diplomat. And it's like, we have to search your plane. And as, as a diplomat, that is in, incredibly insulting because like the, in, the, the cars, the diplomatic cars and diplomatic planes and blah, blah, blah yeah. are supposed to be considered sovereign soil. But they wouldn't let the plane fly over their airspace. And, you know, the, the plane didn't have enough fuel to fly around. So it was like it had to be grounded and searched. And Snowden wasn't on board. But it's like, holy crap, that's, a, that's incredible. All right, let's talk, about, uh, yeah. let's talk about hardware, shall we? Yep, hardware. Yay, hardware. I want to briefly mention the, uh, the eight-core CPU coming out from Intel 17 years uh, later, finally. It's going to be in late uh, 2014, and it's going to be the Haswell E. And before they, you know, they had the ability to do eight cores before. I, I believe we even had some of the six core chips that had two extra cores that were just, you know, completely mechanically separated from the rest of the chip. And it looks like these new eight well, cores. Well, the disturbing are going to thing have... here with this is that it's going to be socket 2011-3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which so it's is not be... backward compatible with socket 2011. Exactly. You're going to have to get a new motherboard for these, and you're going to have to. You're not going to be able to use your existing uh, 2011 chips. It's going to be like pretty much an entirely different platform they should have just change the name of the socket because now it's going to be confusing well what's the difference in 2011 and 2011 whatever you know it's like it's going to be <laughs> it's uh, x99 now yeah it's, it's the chipset so it looks like there's going to be some interesting options there there'll be a 12 core xeon available 24 threads you imagine that and there might even be a 14 core part i've heard that people said that um there are rumors that possibly 14 cores are inside the haswell e but several of them have been mechanically I guess just soldered off or whatever, or, or, or disconnected. I wonder if you'll be able to like hack and, and reconnect those extra cores. It'll probably catch on fire. Uh, well, I think we're going to see an eight an eight core 2011 part in the fall. Although that's probably a Xeon eight core part in yeah, the fall. Yeah, this fall uh, we're going to see. An, yeah, this fall we're going to see an Ivy Bridge E part that'll have six cores, but it'll be a little bit faster. So I'm not six, sure. And, what, and what maybe other eight core is. because of the whole mac thing because the guy at the mac i mean if you've seen the new mac pro mm -hmm, the it's one, too the small micro ITX, to have yeah. yeah it's too small to have two 2011 sockets yeah and they said it was going to be eight core probably a xeon so it would have to be a, it would have to be a single eight core xeon yeah probably what it's going to be uh now this is this is really uh I've, I've been looking at some laptops lately and um there's been a lot of talk about laptops in the forum as people are going to be going back to school and, and whatnot 
but I want you guys to take a look at the AMD uh, APU-based laptops, and especially the ones from MSI with the 8970. If you're looking for a new laptop, those things are going to have a ridiculous amount of power. Now, first off, the quad core is extremely fast, but it's not quite as fast as the Haswell parts you're going to see out there, or even some of the Ivy Bridge parts, but... When you're playing games, it's a true quad core, and uh, you guys can grab one with like an 8970, and it's several hundred dollars less than the Intel counterparts. Plus, the APUs have OpenCL, plus the 8970 has OpenCL. So if you're doing video editing or rendering, there are great ways to go. Now, I know OpenCL does not support Blender yet, and I don't think it supports the new version of After Effects, but it does support Premiere, uh, and it does support Photoshop and a lot of those programs. So those these laptops, for around 1200 bucks are going to absolutely fly. So if you're looking for a laptop, uh, this is a very good way to go, and I'm probably gonna be upgrading to one of these myself very soon, so I'll let you know how it is. I'm really looking forward to playing with one of these. We need to call up MSI like right now. I don't want a 17 inch though, I want a 15 inch. But you know, you guys can get whatever you want. These are like true 15 desktop inch with all the pixels. Yes. Gotta be 1920 by 1080 or greater. Yeah, most of these are 1920 by 1080, but they're 17 inch. I think they've got a couple 15 inch as well. Uh, this one here, the uh, GX7 73BE, uh, 007 US, 32 gigabytes of RAM, ridiculous, and 1.75 gigabytes of, uh, terabytes of hard drive space, gigabytes, yeah. So these things are quite ridiculous. Um, also, we're starting to see some 4K monitors and TVs pop up. We've got the Asus PQ 32-1Q, and that's a 4K monitor. It's only $3,499, but I've got, I really want one of those. 140 uh, pixels per inch, it's quite nice. You won't even need anti-aliasing if you're running this thing because I mean, the pixel density is such that the filters are going to be almost irrelevant at that point. Yeah, Psyche has a 50-inch digital um, 4K TV. It's 120 hertz, but it can't handle 120 frames per second. So it's quite a bit less than that. I think it may be 30 or maybe even 60. But um, I think it's 30 at yeah. the full 4K and 120 at 1080. So, yeah, if you're doing 1080, you can get 120. So that's not bad. I wonder how this looks. Uh, there's some pretty good deals on this thing around, floating around on the Internet. Isn't that the one that Ryan at PC Perspective had? Does he have one of these? Yes, this is the one. Yeah, these are pretty cool. So we're seeing 4Ks floating around out there. Might be time to start looking at them, and they're, they're so cheap. At least that one is. We've also got some Richland APUs to play with. We've got a lot of, a lot of hardware coming in. There's going to be a ton of boxes waiting on me when I get back. It's like I'm going to come back and be like, oh, my God, I can't even get to my office because all the boxes. Uh, science. Are you talking about science? Yep. Norway, they're testing out Thor Energy. That's funny, <laughs> Thor Energy. They're testing out their thorium uh, nuclear reactors, and uh, this could be cleaner, safer, and waste-free. And it's nuclear. Nuclear. Well, there's uh, how do, how there's do, three the kinds of nuclear? thorium reactors. Yeah. <laughs> nuclear. Nuclear, um, is that what he said? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is, the, this is the worst kind of thorium reactor. It's a retrofit of an existing uranium reactor. Okay. It's still, it's good. It's a step in the right direction. It's not a true thorium reactor. So, but if so this better goes than uranium, online, but not, this, not as good as a custom thorium reactor. Yeah, hopefully what will happen is that, is that it'll get worked out at this uh, Norway location, and then the Japanese plants will upgrade to thorium as well. And then at that point, somebody will probably commission a full-scale thorium reactor that's one of the, the more efficient design so it's not backward compatible with uranium we'll never have thorium reactors here because number one you can't make bombs out of it and number two there's too many hippies that don't understand thorium that hate it because it's something they don't understand it's cleaner yeah i really than any of the hippie I really wish the science there. education was higher so that people would look at this and really understand that well you know this is a this the these alternative thorium designs are incredibly good incredibly safe better for the planet virtually no waste it's really incredible. If I was on their marketing team, I would say, you know what, guys? Just say thorium. There's no reason to say nuclear. Just thorium. Hey, we got a thorium power plant. Oh, we like thorium. That sounds cool. As soon as you say nuclear, people freak out. And they're like, oh, no, rabbits are going to die. No, they're not. It's so clean. It's waste-free. It's, it's good energy. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> or or un thorium, uncold fusion with thorium or, you know, some play on cold fusion and because people are like, cold fusion is where we need to be. And it's like, yes, you must capitalize on that by slightly lying about the technology. And thus was born marketing. <laughs> Just to omit, uh, you know, it's, a, it's only an equivocation, which is a pretty bad form of lying, but yeah. Um, the, space off, the SpaceX Grasshopper launch was filmed. Uh, you know, um, I saw a tweet from this. Uh, who was it? Uh, the guy the, the, from uh, Elon Musk. He tweeted this and it was pretty cool. It looks like it's... Uh, running in slow motion because it shoots up and then it lands perfectly in the same spot. So you guys can check that out. It's pretty interesting. Um, the technology that SpaceX is using to 
uh, to land a rocket. But uh, I, I don't have much to say about it other than the fact that you guys should watch it. Like right now, stop what you're doing. Stop this video. Why are you watching this crap? Anyway, we're going to talk about games. Um, did you ever play Realms of Arcania back in the day? Old school RPGs from like the mid-90s. I haven't played any recently. They were like DOS games. I loved these games. Well, anyway, they're bringing back a remake of the first. We're talking like cheesy DOS graphics. And uh, this is going to be a hardcore RPG uh, when you, you know, it'll be first person. But when you go into combat, it changes to uh, turn-based strategy, like sort of a top-down view. And you have multiple characters. It's a lot of fun. And it, if it's anything like the original, it'll be decently difficult. So that, that's fun. If you want something newer, The Elder Scrolls Online will be coming out soon. And uh, there's a new trailer or a new, I guess, talk with the developer here. Um, and they show a quick glimpse of the first-person camera. So for all of us worried about, you know, Elder Scrolls without FPS or first-person camera, FPS, without first-person, well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's going to be there. I'm not sure if it's going to be any good, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to play it. Um, a lot of you guys out there who love Minecraft should check out the new procedurally generated sandbox RPG called Cube World. Uh, when I first looked at this, I immediately thought, oh, this is a cheesy, you know, another Minecraft ripoff, whatever. But it looks pretty cool. After watching the uh, the trailer, I kind of want to play this. It's in alpha right now. You guys can try it out, you know, and, and see if you like it. But it looks like Minecraft plus a bunch of other things and true shaders. Actually, has shadows. So that looks pretty interesting. Maybe we'll end up with a server of that. Who knows? I know we're going to have a server of um, Rise of the Triad. If you guys do not have Rise of the Triad yet, I know I've been tweeting about this. Go get it. It's on pre-order. I condone it because I've already played it, and it's fun as hell. It's like the, the new version of Unreal Tournament or whatever. It's like the fast-paced shooter of this generation. It's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know. Yeah, we'll be playing a lot of Rise of the Triad. There's a lot of people on our forum that are always looking for Zelda-style games. Well, there's a pretty cartoony, interesting Zelda-esque, they're calling it, adventure called um, It'll Do. I guess that's what it's called, It'll Do. Anyway, you play a, a, a female uh, character, and you've got like a flying fox as your sidekick that looks kind of like Navi. And she looks kind of like Link with the shaggy blonde hair and everything. And it's just kind of an irreverent, fun game that completely rips off Zelda, but doesn't care and makes fun of itself while it's doing it. But it's like the most blatant ripoff of Zelda I think I've ever seen. But it could be a little bit of fun, and people are saying that it's fun. So you guys can go check that out right now if you want as well. Is this on Good it, Old it's Games a rip off. It, it, It's a ripoff, but it's self-referential humor is the thing that makes it interesting. Yeah, so tongue-in-cheek tongue ripoff. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it, everybody. The end of the things. I'll be back in the regular studio next week. If you're lucky. And with that will come the outpouring flood of videos, probably like 20 a day. Yeah, we outlined about, uh, oh, 50, 60 videos. That, some of them we've shot like half of them. Say about 30 or 40 of them we've done like some shooting on. But it's about time to hire another editor, I think. It's, it's about that time. Anyway. So look for about a gazillion videos coming soon. Look for us to be back. Look for me to get a haircut. And uh, I don't know, that's the end of the video. Just click subscribe and, and, and go do something productive. Bye.